So good afternoon, everybody. Let us start our afternoon session. We have here with us Sam Raskin from the state, from the University of Texas at Austin. And he will tell us about quantum duality and Morita theory for chiral algebras. Please, the screen is yours. Thank you. Thanks so much for inviting me. And I'm very sorry that I can't be there in person for personal reasons I have to be here this summer. But I hope that you all are having a great conference. Um, yeah, so what I wanna talk about today is some, uh, some joint work of mine with Justin Hilburn. And really what I wanna emphasize is a, a few formal patterns that came up um, that we were talking about while we were preparing it. <clears throat> this Morita theory for chiral algebras. Um, these formal aspects are really influenced by many, many people. So here are a few names, Ben Zvi, Braverman, Costello, Dimoft, Gaiotto, Finkelberg, Yu. We don't really claim originality for it or, or anything like that. Um, I just sort of wanted to do a little bit of storytelling around it. And uh, this is uh, some stuff I picked up through osmosis. And uh, yeah. Similarly, this is a math physics conference. I'm a geometric representation theorist. I don't have training in math physics, so I might have weird motivations or I might not be able to answer some simple questions or something like that. And I apologize if that happens. Okay, so what uh, I want to start with is, is a little bit of motivation. So uh, for me, the kind of, you know, one of the most striking things about the literature out there in, in uh, physics as a mathematician is the role of dualities. So, uh, and many of these have some kind of conceptual source. It's like these string theory conjectures that uh, that seem very tidy and that are completely inaccessible as a mathematician. So it's a very compelling situation for me. So roughly speaking, what a duality here means is that you have two quantum field theories, Z1 and Z2, maybe with concrete sort of Lagrangian uh, formulations, and you're told that in some sense, the theories are supposed to be fundamentally equivalent in a way that does not respect their Lagrangian presentations. So this means that the fields might take totally different forms, uh, but some kind of fundamental physical features match. So for instance, in, uh, in the kind of one example we'll talk about later, one of the theories is a gauge theory, the other one's not a gauge theory. And so I wanna take the following as kind of an onsatz. So many theories are defined by an algebra of, of local operators, which I'll call A. And sort of technically, it should be factorization algebra. It's the kind of thing I have in mind. So others are not so far from such a case. So they might be sort of non-affine generalizations of, of a family of such examples. I say this kind of as, as an algebraic geometer. They might be sort of built, they might, they might fit into a family um, which includes some theories defined by a factorization algebra. Um, and you can then sort of draw intuition from that. So in this case, I wanna say that the equivalence or duality between these quantum field theories attached to two uh, algebras of, of local operators, that this should be a sort of Morita equivalence between A and B. So I wanna take Morita equivalence as a, uh, as a ansatz for, um, for modeling what, what we mean when we talk about duality between quantum field theories. So first I wanna discuss the one dimensional case as a warmup, and then I'll specialize to the two dimensional holomorphic setting. And really as we'll talk about in a few slides, uh, the dimensions here are a little uh, skewed. So it'll really be 2D and 3D, but it'll feel like 1D and 2D or some, okay. So suppose that, okay, any questions at this point just from that introductory material? Okay, so first let me just start with, uh, you know, classically what's meant by, by uh, Morita equivalence or Morita duality. So suppose that A and B are two associative algebras. In this case, a Morita equivalence between them is an equivalence between their categories of modules. Um, it's an equivalence between A mod and B mod. So just a technical comment, all of my categories are derived and this matters at certain points. So sometimes this is called derived Morita equivalence. Such a categorical relationship between A and B, actually I, it maybe looks abstract, but it can lead to really kind of concrete 
uh, relationships between A and B. So something more concrete you can get is that the Hochschild homology of A is going to be the same as the Hochschild homology of B, actually compatible with some subtle structure, this S1 action. Uh, the reason is just that that Hochschild homology you can you can show uh, can be constructed using the category alone. It's defined for certain categories, just uh, and and uh, depends only on A mod, not on A itself. So more generally, I think of Morita theory as you know the idea of considering just a category instead of uh, an algebra. Uh, and this philosophy, it's the same thing as non-commutative geometry. I'm sure it has other. Uh, packagings as well. So one can uh, kind of reinterpret what we just discussed as follows. So first, an associative algebra A determines this category A mod, as discussed. <laughs> um, and in fact, it needs this, I need a special technical property about A mod. It's what's called dualizable. Um, <clears throat> so uh, more generally, any DG category C, any sort of derived category, is going to determine a two-dimensional extended topological field theory that I'm going to call Z sub C. So here, essentially, really, I mean uh, uh, that it's only defined, the sort of zero, one extended. It's defined on zero and one dimensional manifolds. So explicitly, what this theory Z sub C assigns is it takes the category C itself to, I guess, let me remind the format, a two-dimensional field theory you would expect to assign numbers to two manifolds, vector spaces to one manifolds, and categories to uh, zero manifolds. So in this case, it's going to assign the category C to the point. It's going to assign uh, the chain complex of vector spaces, Hochschild homology of C, to the circle. And uh, yeah, that's... that's top line structure of what this theory does. And now let me just uh, kind of comment for fun that if I sort of break the Morita invariance and I write my category in terms of uh, as literal A mods, like the category of A modules, then whenever I have an N tuple of points inside of the circle, kind of the, whatever Hochschild homology is, the construction uh, of this, you know, cyclically ordered set, is going to induce a natural map from A tensor N to Hochschild homology of A. And you can sort of think of this as, as analogous to correlators between local operators, at least if you pretend the Hochschild homology is C, or maybe you're giving a path integral map uh, from the Hochschild homology to C. Uh, so this Hochschild homology, it's somehow a universal recipient for correlators in this game. And uh, yeah, just a quick comment about extending to two manifolds, that's not super relevant. So about dimensions, so just because it's slightly confusing, I just sort of want to uh, nip this in the bud. So we think of an algebra A usually defining a quantum mechanics and not a two-dimensional theory. So what's happening here? And this will get more confusing, I think, also once we uh, transition to chiral algebras. So what's happening? So properly, what a physicist would call an n-dimensional QFT really kind of comes in a pair. So there's an n-dimensional theory of states and an n plus one dimensional theory of observables. So the state theory is, is going to naturally live at the boundary of the observable theory. Um, so in the above example, we think of this Hilbert space V, like in you know sort of this setting of quantum mechanics, you can think about the Hilbert space V as defining a one-dimensional quantum field theory. Uh, the two-dimensional theory Z sub A is gonna be like some kind of theory of observables. And then the action of A on V is in, you, you say it by just saying like V is an object of, of A mod. Um, and uh, yeah. And uh, maybe I should comment. This sort of structure was also discussed a lot in uh, Dan Fried's talk. So in this talk, I'm really just kind of interested in these theory of observables. So sometimes the dimension is going to seem like it's like one too big. That's just kind of the way it is. Questions at this point before we go on to chiral algebras? So far, no, thank you. Great, thanks. 
Okay, so uh, I want to talk about the theory of chiral algebras, which are also called factorization algebras, uh, and are uh, uh, in suitable regimes equivalent to vertex algebras. So uh, this theory in the form I'm talking about was developed by Balenson and Trinfeld, um, and there's not everyone has like super dug into their their uh, book about this. So just to get everyone on the same page, I want to give just kind of a super brief recap. Like, what are the outcomes of of their theories? This so uh, it's not exhaustive. Like, for instance, I won't tell you how to construct a chiral algebra, but um, but still, this is uh, this is the kind of structure they attach. So first of all, the setting is going to be a smooth algebraic curve over a field um, of characteristic zero. So you can think the field is C. It's just to emphasize that the the theory is is uh, algebraic. It's not um, it's not uh, uh, dependent on the specific differential geometry of Riemann surfaces or something like that. So in this setting, we can talk about chiral algebras on, on X and we denote them by A. And as I said a moment ago, vertex algebras are sort of roughly equivalent to chiral algebras defined on every curve and basically all chiral algebras uh, arise by this procedure um, or some mild modifications of it. That's not a theorem, it's just like a, a thing you run into in, in life. So I'll talk about uh, some examples later in the talk, but not right now. So for a chiral algebra A on this curve X and a fixed uh, sort of marked point on the curve, there's a category attached to this, which is called the category of chiral A module supported at the point. Um, so typically this thing admits a sort of concrete description involving Laurent series. So this is gonna kind of geometrically correspond to, to having something to do with like a kind of punctured, formal punctured disk around this point. So for instance, if I take the Katz-Moody chiral algebra, I'm gonna get modules over G tensor with the Laurent series. So this Lie algebra G goes into the definition of the Katz-Moody chiral algebra and uh, yeah. <clears throat> So just as an example, there's always some kind of canonical module inside of this category called the vacuum module at the point. And this, uh, this module, you should think of it as being kind of like a small module in some sense. It's like not too big. It's not, it, so it's much more like A as an A by module than A as a just module over itself. Um, uh, so next, for the next piece of structure, so that, that was kind of the local structure, I should say, of the, of the theory. Now I want to talk about the global structure of the theory. So for this, we have to assume that the curve is projective or compact or um, however you say it. So in this case, there's a, um, so the previous theory worked perfectly well for punctured things. It was all kind of local around the, the point that I marked. Um, this time, if the curve is projective, then there's going to be actually a vector space of um, chiral homology or conformal blocks for this theory, which I call H chiral of XA. Moreover, for any N tuple of points, there's, uh, there's a canonical map between the fibers of this chiral algebra at those points to the chiral homology. And again, it's sort of, you should think of it as roughly encoding the, the correlators up to maybe this thing should have a map to see that's like a path integral. Um, typically, this chiral homology is it's computed using kind of the geometry of the projective curve. So it might involve uh, the moduli stack of G bundles on the curve or local systems on the curve or maps from the curve to some target um, in a kind of sigma model sort of picture, but there'll be algebraic maps in this context. More generally, let me say that I'll, I'll kind of need this. There's actually a chiral homology functor um, which takes modules at, at N points and marked points and produces a vector space out of them. <clears throat> so I could have said something similar about Hochschild homology. It's not just um, a, a vector space, but you can think about Hochschild homology of a bimodule. So here, if I take an n tuple of yeah, I take an n tuple of modules, each one sitting at uh, one of the marked points, and then I produce from this a certain vector space. And in this case, there's going to be natural maps m1 tensor up to mn to this chiral homology. Um, if I 
change the vacuum module, if I just sort of take one of these modules to be the, uh, the vacuum representation at the point, then it's not going to change the chiral homology. It'll be the same as like for the other n minus one uh, entries. And so this kind of structure does really recover the picture from the previous slide. If I took all of these modules to be the, the vacuum representation, this will just recover the chiral homology of A with no decorations here. OK, so that's the major structure of the theory. So now I want to kind of take as, as a thesis that the a thesis that I'm going to try to explain a little bit. Um, so the, I want to say that the Morita theory of chiral algebras is really kind of governed by three-dimensional kind of, in some sense, algebraic quantum field theories. And uh, yeah, let's take some some filling in. So I'll I'll say what it is. But this is just uh, to orient you for the moment. This is what I'm. This is kind of my my uh, point. <clears throat> so let's recall that um, a three dimensional TFT, for instance, would assign a number to a three manifold, a vector space to a two manifold, category to a one manifold. So I want to kind of outline for a moment a definition of what a okay it's everything's algebraic just I'm, I'm not using any differential geometry or analysis or anything uh, my theory is you should think of it as being one two extended so uh, being defined only on one and two dimensional manifolds but basically for me a 3D field theory z on a smooth proper algebraic curve x um, is okay some data I'll say what it is over several slides. So first of all, whenever you give me a point in the curve, I want to have a certain DG category attached to it. So it's what the theory assigns to uh, to the puncture disk. That's what you should picture here. What you should be picturing as a kind of circle that I don't know for some reason the formalness of it makes it behave like it's one dimensional and not two dimensional. Maybe. <laughs> um, so uh, so we're thinking of this puncture disk as a circle, and you're attaching a a category to that one dimensional manifold. So in as context, this Z of the circle is the category of line operators for the theory. So now I want to give a little bit of um, additional structure here. So first of all, there's a kind of cobordism um, from the empty set to the puncture disk, which is uh, given by the formal disk. Um, so spec of, of Taylor series instead of spec of Laurent series. And I'm going to draw this formal disk like this. And, uh, and this cobordism is going to define for me uh, a sort of map from what the theory does to the empty set to what the theory does on the puncture disk. And that just amounts to a marked object. So this, this object is called the vacuum or unit object um, at this point, or the trivial line, people will say sometimes. Just a kind of comment. Uh, so in this algebraic setting, all of the cobordisms, quote unquote, that I draw are just inherently asymmetric. So you can go this way, you can't go the other way. I don't really have a, a, a smart explanation of this. It's just kind of the way it is. Um, next, if I take this cobordism, so I take my, my curve, I remove it like my marked point, and I think about that as somehow a cobordism from the puncture disk to the empty set, that's going to define for me a certain functor um, from, from uh, the category attached to the puncture disk to the category of vector spaces. Um, and uh, same thing if I remove endpoints, <clears throat> I'll get a map from the tensor product of these categories to, um, to vect. And that I call chiral homology. So here, uh, there are kind of additional axioms I haven't quite stated. You should be allowed to like move the points and let them collide. And there's some stuff about round space. It's a little technical, but a consequence of that is that this, uh, this vector space, the chiral homology of the unit of the vacuum object is actually going to be independent of the choice of point. Um, and it should be thought of here as, as the vector space that the theory attaches to the, the two manifold X. So I told you that there's a category um, attached to a circle, that there's um, a vector space attached to a two manifold and gave you some structure relating the, the two things. 
So again, there are other more technical axioms about varying points and inserting the vacuum, uh, but this is the top line stuff. And all of that is just can be said very quickly with the words like unital factorization category. Um, so let me just record a fantasy for a moment. It's like, so what I would really like is to be able to talk about a zero to extended field theory in this context, like the extending down to zero dimensional manifolds in, in the setting of the cobordism hypothesis is a very powerful tool. Uh, here, so here somehow when I deal with these one, two extended things, it's kind of a complicated structure a priori. And, uh, and there's not some like kind of simple object governing it the way there is in the cobordism hypothesis. I say this is a fantasy. It's a, I think it's a long shot that there is an answer to this question, but I can dream. So uh, main example, as should be implied at this point, is that if you have a chiral algebra, then you could say that what Balenson and Drinfeld are doing for you in their book is, is producing a three-dimensional theory out of it, um, the C sub A, which again is sort of, you think of this chiral algebra as having something to do with like 2D CFT, and, uh, and this is somehow that, in that picture, it's really kind of the, you're thinking in the states picture, and this is the observables picture. So it's like the dimension thing we talked about before. So just to be explicit, this theory is taking the category of, of A module supported at X, Carol A modules, and uh, producing that category on, on the circle. The uh, vacuum representation of A is this unit object, and chiral homology is that thing defined by Valenson and Drenfeld called chiral homology. Um, <clears throat> so in this case, we can sort of take by fiat uh, Morita theory for chiral algebras to mean equivalences of these kinds of algebraic theories attached to chiral algebras. So now in this context, Justin Hilbert and I proved something kind of non-trivial of the shape, uh, except I'll, I'll say, uh, you know, just as a warning, one side is kind of non-affine. They're not literally both attached to chiral algebras, but uh, what I wanna kind of do is explain the context for our result. Okay, so, um, so question, how, how are Morita equivalences for chiral algebra supposed to like arise? It's like, you know, when, when should you ex like, when should you expect something to happen like this? And so the answer, uh, as far as I'm concerned is that there's uh, many precise predictions which are coming from the 3D mirror symmetry program. And I, I should say somehow, um, okay, maybe I won't say. Um, so first, some attributions here. So there's, this is like a big circle of ideas. It was developed by many people um, over decades. And, uh, and I was not involved in that development. And, uh, and also I didn't even like, I, I'm, I should say, I'm like, whenever I do the attributions here, I'm worried that I'm missing people and I'm pretty sure I am. And I'm just sorry about that. It's, it's my ignorance and it's not meant um, out of, out of uh, you know, cruelty. Um, so on the math physics side, what we're talking about is kind of three-dimensional mirror symmetry and implicitly it's relationship with four-dimensional S-duality. I'm gonna a little bit package that into 3D mirror symmetry, even though that's an unfair description. So the, um, the, the 3D mirror symmetry story was uh, initiated by Trilligator and Cyberg, and then uh, further developed by Hanani Witten and many others. So giving the connection with string theory and S-duality and things like this. So then uh, the connections with four-dimensional S-duality were, as I understand, first considered by Gyota Witten, and the sharp mathematical conjectures I'm going to talk about here were considered by um, Hilburn Yu, maybe jointly with Tim Ofton and Coyoto, and then Braberman and Finkelberg. 
So also important parts of the story have kind of cousins in harmonic analysis, which is a really um, beautiful connection. So that uh, connection has really been, uh, so I guess uh, that again, circle of ideas somehow was, um, uh, grew out of work of Zekleritis and Venkatesh that provided a kind of unified perspective on period expressions for L functions. And uh, then I think uh, Ben's V joined the collaboration, emphasizing this connection with things happening in math physics and geometric Langlands. Um, and their forthcoming work really kind of joins these two perspectives together and makes connections with geometric Langlands and, and things like this. Um, okay. So uh, now uh, let me uh, uh, discuss what the format of 3D mirror symmetry is. So uh, what I'm so given some kind of stack Y. So stack you can think it's like a manifold. Maybe it's the quotient of a manifold by a group. In which case I would consider some gauge fields. So in this case, physicists say that the sort of like okay, this is a non-algebraic thing, heavily analytic. The 3D sigma model um, ZY with target the cotangent bundle of Y has N equals four supersymmetry. So in fact, this should really only depend on the hyperkeller manifolds, cotangent bundle of Y and, and so on. But I'm uh, just for notational reasons, not going to emphasize that today. Um, and in the case that you have a 3D N equals four theory, there's sort of two, uh, well, two of the twists that you can uh, create out of it are the A and the B twists. Um, so in practice, these theories are kind of algebraic and I'm gonna treat them as such. This all is kind of a heuristic for me in the first place. Um, and so how you would get something algebraic out of something analytic, no comment. Um, <clears throat> but the basic properties of these twists are supposed to be as follows. So if I take the A theory, the A twist um, for, for uh, this theory attached to Y, and I apply this to the puncture disk, I'm gonna get something called D of, of the space of maps from the puncture disk to Y. So here D is the category of, of uh, D modules, which you know, um, uh, uh, for me it's the category of D modules, but for someone else it might be some big, huge version of, of some kind of category of brains or, Co-isotropic brains; these kinds of things live in in this world. Um, uh, and then the B twist is going to be some kind of category of coherent sheaves. So, ENCO is meant to uh, to be intimidating, so that we can't worry too much about what exactly is meant there. But it's going to be now maps from the puncture disk to ROM into Y. So here the difference is. Uh, in the first place, I'm considering kind of algebraic or something like holomorphic maps from puncture disk to Y. Here, I consider ones that are in some sense uh, locally constant along this puncture disk. And uh, that gets more fun in the case where, where Y is, um, is a quotient stack, in which case uh, you're gonna see G bundles with connection, with algebraic connections appearing um, in this uh, space of maps and kind of certain sections of them. So. Um, okay, so as I said, D means D modules. And so in the case that, uh, so I just sort of want to make this connection to chiral algebras. So when Y is affine, this category of D modules is maybe smooth and affine. It's the category of modules for, um, for uh, a certain uh, vertex algebra or chiral algebra attached to this uh, data, which is called the chiral algebra of, uh, of differential operators, the CDO attached to Y and, uh, and a sort of uh, other name for it, you'll see a lot in physics literature is a curved beta gamma system. On the other hand, this INCO thing is going to be modules. Oh, this is missing. Okay, it's modules for a constant commutative chiral algebra with fibers with fiber functions on Y. So uh, if you open a book on vertex algebras, you'll see that the, um, the commutative ones are, just commutative algebra is equipped with a derivation. And here my derivation is just zero. Um, so I take functions on Y with the zero derivation. It's sort of a little funky from the perspective of the theory, but it is what it is. Um, 
Okay, so um, so those are kind of my, this is again, my sort of onsats for uh, extracting the A and B twists algebraically from, uh, from some kind of concrete, uh, like some, some uh, 3D n equals four theory presented, uh, you know, with a Lagrangian presentation. So Sigma model into some cotangent bundle. Okay, so now let me say uh, kind of what, what mirror symmetry is in this format. So if you have a 3D n equals four theory, there's going to be something called its abstract mirror dual, Z star. So when I when I say this, I it's this is uh, it's like the kind of trivial construction only a mathematician would ever uh, talk about. But I like the notation. So uh, this is just so it's not to be confused with like something non-trivial about mirror symmetry that'll come up in a moment. But let me just say this is like I'm sort of saying the constructions you can do with 3D n equals four theories. So you can take a twists and b twists. Another thing you can do is you can take this abstract dual theory. This is just like the same 3D theory, but the supersymmetries are like acting in a conjugated way. And uh, the way that conjugating works is that it swaps the a twist and the b twist. So like what you used to call the a twist, you now call the b twist. What you used to call the b twist, you now call the a twist. And uh, and as far as I'm concerned, that's what this construction does. Um, so it's just it's a, it's like in in practice, it looks like relabeling the action of the supersymmetry algebra in like a way that is equally valid but not the standard conventions. Uh, okay, so now the non-trivial thing is uh, the non-trivial part of 3D mirror symmetry is when you have mirror dual pairs. So this means a pair of, of stacks Y1 and Y2 with ZY1 being the abstract dual theory to Y2. Um, and, uh, and the mirror symmetry kind of, I, I, I should say in the theory, there's, there's just many, many, many examples of this that are, are understood. And you know, there's kind of a, a host of problems you have once you um, once you have a mirror dual pair like this. For instance, you can try to test. So I mean, these these pairs you should think of them as as um, conjectural pairs. Um, it's not that someone has has uh, produced um, an equivalence like this because the terms themselves are like loosely defined at best. Um, it's that. Uh, various tests have been done, or the this kind of relationship has been derived from uh, more fundamental kind of string theory duality conjectures. Um, okay, so kind of given the previous slide, whenever you have a pair y one and y two, this like a, a putative mirror dual pair, uh, this gives you a bunch of interesting mathematical conjectures. Um, so as I said, I don't want to survey um, mirror dual pairs here. There's a ton of them. They're very typically non-abelian in nature, but I'm going to give one example, which is uh, important to me for purposes of this talk, which is when Y1 is equal to the affine line um, or complex numbers, if you want, and Y2 is going to be the affine line mod GM. So this is a kind of uh, stack quotient in this, in this context. So kind of non-separated and remembers some stuff. It's just sort of encoding, you can think of it as just encoding the action of GM on, on A1. Um, okay, so in this case, <clears throat> the theory, like in physics terms, the theory ZY1 is a pure hypermultiplet, while the theory ZY2 is a U1 gauged hypermultiplet. So in this case, the prediction um, that the A twist of this theory is the B twist of the other theory, it amounts to um, to an equivalence. Uh, I guess I switched left and right here, but um, so this A twist of, of uh, the theory for Y1 is going to be D modules on the space of maps from the puncture disk to A1. So that's like a sort of huge vector space um, of, of Laurent series, and I'm taking some kind of category of D modules on it. And on the other side, I have the space of maps from the puncture disk to A1 mod GM. 
So that parameterizes um, a line bundle with connection on the puncture disk and a flat section of it. And I'm taking uh, coherent sheaves on this infinite dimensional singular space and uh, and I'm expecting an equivalence. And so this is my theorem with Justin um, is that this this works. Um, so I should say just like technically really we just gave an equivalence of the category of line operators. So we sort of worked out the global aspects, but haven't written it down yet. Um, as far as I know, this is the first sort of like honestly derived um, Morita theorem for, for chiral algebra is, okay, they're not, this one's not technically, so this one is governed by a chiral algebra and this one is not quite because of this A1 mod GM. So that's what I was sort of saying earlier that, that um, many of the theories that you run into, they're, at least they live in a family with with other um, uh, uh, theories that are sort of affine and come from chiral algebras in, in some sense. Um, so there are essentially theories that come from chiral algebras in, in this story, um, and you can think of it as this kind of derived Morita theory for them. And uh, it's the, uh, as far as I know, the first sort of non-classical example. I mean, in some sense, it's by definition, I'll just call anything classical that uh, <laughs> came earlier. Um, okay, so uh, I have a few minutes left. Maybe I can uh, pause for questions at, at this point. Let's see. <clears throat> it seems that we do not have any questions now, so please continue. Great. Okay. Um, yeah, and maybe I'll I'll emphasize uh, this the setting. It somehow um, so it basically amounts to like. I mean, I, I'm writing it for, for A1 and GM, but it, it, uh, it sort of covers the abelian case of mirror symmetry um, generally. And there's something, uh, these are like big categories that are not of topological nature. And so there's always something, um, uh, I think a little funny about, about that. Like they're hugely, Coisotropic brains and stuff in this, um, so it's uh, it's a big guy. Um, okay, so I said uh, that the me who wrote this talk in the past doesn't think that there's time to say much more. There's a few minutes, um, so I want to say a, a little bit about the geometry of of both sides. So. Uh, just for convenience, I'm going to call O the ring of Taylor series and big K the ring of uh, Laurent series. And uh, then I'm going to just sort of shorten notation with this L notation. So uh, I can consider maps from the disk to Y, that's L plus, and LY will be maps from the puncture disk to Y. Um, and when Y is affine, I get a scheme or, or an in scheme. Um, but infinite type objects. So they're inherently infinite dimensional. So there are these theories of D modules on, on such, such spaces. Let me just to kind of say very concretely what, what I'm talking about. So when I talk about this, I can think about this like big K, this like vector space of Laurent series. It's a kind of affine space in this context, and it has uh, coordinates given by the Laurent coefficients. And the fact that like Laurent series have bounded tails, um, you know, they at a certain point, the coefficients become zero. That's reflected in this like end nature of, of the vector space. Um, and so I'm gonna take these coordinates AI given by Laurent coefficients. And then let me tell you what, what a D module is. So usually it's a quasi coherent sheaf um, with an action of, of uh, vector fields. In this case, uh, what it's going to be is a vector space with kind of a bunch of, I should have said commuting operators a sub i from v to v. Uh, so that's because these are the coordinates of my vector space. And uh, it's got some kind of property encoding that endness. It's just that for every vector v and v, a sub i times v is equal to zero for all sufficiently negative i's. Um, now a d module is something very similar. So it additionally has a bunch of commuting operators, partial sub a i, the basic 
vector fields pointing along the coordinates, such that for each vector v and v, uh, these partial ai's of v vanish, but now for i sufficiently large. So they're kind of a, a little bit dual. Um, and of course, the basic commutation operation should be satisfied. Um, it's a defining property of, of a vial algebra or whatever. Um, so this kind of data is just literally equivalent to a module over the um, vial or beta gamma or CDO on A1 vertex algebra. This is just what it is. So uh, I can say this a little bit more categorically, and that's a little bit better for derived categories. I'm going to skip over that for now. Um, so in the same way, there's a category of D modules on loops into GM, the multiplicative group. Um, and the, the action of GM on A1 plays a big role here. So this is a monoidal category under convolution, in fact, symmetric monoidal. So that's uh, using this, this group structure here. I could tensor objects together, and tensor product is commutative. As such, it acts canonically on D modules on, on the space of Laurent series, uh, just because GM acts on A1, loops on GM acts on loops into A1. Um, now, from the kind of perspective of geometric representation theory, you can think of our problem as trying to understand the, the spectral decomposition of this category as a module for, for loops on GM. Um, so to kind of give a give meaning to this, I want to um, uh, recall some kind of background here from Balenson and Drinfeld. So this is a version of local class field theory in this context. So what they say is that D modules on loops into GM is the same as quasi-coherent sheaves on the space of, of local systems for GM. And this is as symmetric monoidal equivalences. So you can actually think about this as, um, <clears throat> uh, like in physics terms, this is kind of uh, saying that, uh, I mean, maybe just as, as context for this for, for a moment, um, if you have, uh, four-dimensional S duality for like something abelian, so U1 versus U1 in this context, there are going to be uh, certain like two categories that those theories attach to um, to a circle in this case, and they're actually going to be modules over this monoidal category, modules over this monoidal category. If you pass to again sort of A and B twists appropriately, and so you can think about um, this as some kind of incarnation of of uh, Abelian S duality, um, and and you get something kind of very strong. I, maybe I should have said earlier. Well, I guess I'll comment on this later. Um, so here, this this locus GM, as I said, is the moduli of rank one, what I call Duran local system. So it's a line bundle on the puncture disk with an algebraic connection, um, and it's the, the I should say the theory of like irregular singularities and stuff um, comes in here. And I say irregular. Connect, sorry, when I say algebraic connection, it's up to algebraic equivalence, not like topological. Um, and so this is a definition of this space. So now um, uh, we write this Y as, uh, as that space of maps that appeared in the INCO in the statement of the theorem earlier. So it's a line bundle, a connection, and a flat section of the connection. See? Um, so uh, the hardest part of this this work, as far as uh, I was concerned, was proving stuff about this y, which is of some kind of difficult infinite dimensional nature. And in such settings, we only really have studied things like manifolds before and not spaces as, as singular as this y. Um, at some course level, it looks very simple. But when you actually dig into it, it's um, got a bunch of new phenomena. So now let me just state our theorem again. This int co of y is equivalent to d modules on loops a1. Um, this is compatible with uh, this local geometric class field theory. So there's a natural action of quasi co locus gm on the left side and d of loops gm on the right hand side. And it's compatible with that construction. Um, <clears throat> so uh, maybe I should emphasize it's not. It doesn't play well with abelian categories. It's really an honestly derived thing. Uh, and uh, and physically, this is sort of what I was saying before. So this compatibility with 
class field theory is, is expressed as, um, as a compatibility with these 3D theories being boundary conditions for abelian gang mills in, in 4D for U1. And, uh, and uh, this is also sort of a reason, it, it hits at the reason that we kind of can't do anything more in the modern day. So the, um, the other examples at least are kind of derived from uh, S-dual boundary conditions for non-abelian uh, uh, theories. And we just, and so you need some kind of version of like local geometric Langlands to make sense of, of this sort of uh, equivalence in, in broader terms, like things are, are supposed to match in this two category. And we don't know that the, that the two categories are equivalent outside of the abelian world. And so this seems to be for the moment, the only sort of uh, result of this nature that's within reach. Um, Okay, so comment on relationship to Tate's thesis, and thanks. Thank you very much for the talk. And now we have time for several questions. Question I maybe should have asked right at the beginning. Um, you said that a duality between two theories means that the Algebras of local observables of the two theories are Morita equivalent. But physicists, maybe it's because you're in one dimension higher in a sense. Physicists usually think of duality. For example, S duality means that local operators of n equals four super Young Mills theory of a group G are isomorphic to local operators of the same theory for the group G dual. So physicists usually say that the duality means that the algebra operators, operator algebras, are isomorphic, not Morita equivalent. Yeah, I think that's about this gap between the dimensions in this context. So in that example, there would be a five dimensional story where, uh, so in four dimensions, the operator algebras of n equals four for the groups G and G dual are equivalent, but you would call that a Morita equivalence of something that would live in five dimensions? So I, I find that, I mean, the, just that, like, so for like, for like a dimension down, for instance, um, like I, um, the literal format of like this Morita equivalence for, for local operators, for instance, it's something that, um, that plays really well for theories that aren't gauge theories. That's what I was kind of saying about this affineness. So in that case, the kind of the whole theory is really like governed by this algebra of, of local operators in, in some sense. And, uh, and I think of gauge theories kind of by analogy with that, um, with that affine situation uh, and just, like personally just follow my my nose figuring out what the generalization of various statements are supposed to be and uh and so i i find it so in this in this context where you're talking about like pure gauge theory it's a little bit hard for me to turn it into the setting of like local operators personally because it's it's much more robust um i, I know that's not a satisfying answer to the question but to clarify what I was saying, the physicist would say that the gauge invariant local operators are the same for the two dual theories. Um, when, when you construct the theory concretely from some kind of Lagrangian or whatever, you have a much larger family of not necessarily gauge invariant local operators. Those aren't equivalent between the dual descriptions, but the physical content is in the gauge invariant stuff and the gauge invariant operators are the same between the two dual theories. That's the way physicists look at it anyway. Yeah. Yeah. That, it's, it's a reasonable question. And, and, and let me, let me uh, think about it uh, offline and uh, not, not say something wrong. I, I, I didn't think, think about it uh, before.
in your main theorem, uh, on right hand side, uh, the category can be viewed as a uh, um, category of modules of beta gamma system of rank one, right? Mm -hmm. um, so if you uh, consider kind of, kind of a, a collection of modules and uh, you compute the chi homology uh, of uh, uh, projective algebraic curve. So what's the interpretation uh, on, right, on, on left hand side? Um, uh, yeah, maybe another question. Yeah, so um, uh, uh, this. so um, so the um, So in this context, you can consider the moduli space of a line bundle with connection on the global curve. Um, sorry, not, not the global. So you take, you take uh, sorry, I'm uploading for a moment. You take your curve and you've sort of implicitly like marked a point, for instance, on it, on this projective curve. And so you can consider line bundles with connection on, uh, on that punctured curve. And that's going to map to our space Y just by restriction. If you have a line bundle with connection, oh, and a flat section, I should have said. Um, so some version of this space Y on the on the punctured curve. So, uh, uh, so this is going to map to our space Y just by restriction. You take this line bundle, this connection, the section, and you just restrict them to the puncture disk. And then you can pull back your coherent sheaf and take global sections of it. And uh, that's a functor, so to say, of global nature. Uh, from this category of coherent sheaves down to the category of vector spaces, and that's a that's the chiral homology functor in this context. Thank you very much. And yeah, and and again, this is the kind of thing where I, I personally find it um, helpful to think in terms of chiral algebras. Like, you know, I basically you can run this algorithm for any constant chiral algebra uh, of that nature. And just see what the formula is, and kind of extract what what it's supposed to be in the gauged case as well. Sure. I see no further questions, so thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. And now we will have another uh, online talk.